Our first reading today is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one abide, who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. of my Savior, I will call upon your name, and keep my eyes above the waves, my soul will rest in your embrace.
The text this morning comes from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. Listen for the word of the Lord. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together to hear your word to our hearts. Open our minds so that we, like the disciples, may understand the scriptures as they apply to our lives. Help us, O Lord, to make that connection. Amen. Shalom! Yay! That's what Jesus said when he walked into the room filled with the disciples and his friends. And shalom is a cross between peace And hey, so it can be this deep, deep connection when delivered a certain way, or it can just be a, hi, how you doing today? The friends gathered probably didn't experience it as meaningful or casual because to them, it was terrifying. The dead one is among them and acting as if, Nothing weird is going on. Here's Jesus. Surprise! Come on. Come on, people. I'm here. No, really, it's me. I swear it's me. Look, look. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Come on. Touch. Do you remember last week when uh, Longinus, that centurion, he struck me inside here? Look, come on over. Come feel it. Feel it. It's me. It's real. They're looking at him like, um, uh, okay. Imagine how you must feel. Can't you see? I imagine some of them were trembling. Some of them were probably rubbing their eyes and opening them like, is he still here? Oh, still here. Yeah, yeah. Some of them were filled with joy and probably running up and then stopping and running up. Sort of like if you won the lottery. Like, you're all excited but not really sure if you won. You're not going to know for sure until you actually go and someone confirms that that's true. I can just see all this going on. And, and I bet if it were today, somebody would say, am I being punked? Am I being punked? This can't be this Jesus guy. And then Jesus says, which I think is really funny, hey, have you got something to eat? When I read this text, I read it to my son because I thought it was so funny. Him and his girlfriend were sitting there in the kitchen. And I said, I love this because doesn't it sound, and Will's like, yeah, Mom, it sounds like he just walked in, opened the refrigerator, and looked around going, hey, what do you got to eat in here? He made himself at home because he was with his friends. You know, he's with his friends, his buddies. What do you got? I smell something. Somebody cooking something? Mmm. Yeah, it smells pretty good. And he knew that when he ate, they would understand that he was real. Because human beings eat and ghosts do not. Relationships in Scripture often are gathered around the table. 
but relationships in real life also are gathered around the table. It makes sense because it makes us really human. Hey, have you had time to get together for a bite this week? We almost always say that to one another because we know we can sit down at lunch or at dinner and we can talk about things we wouldn't normally talk about if we're standing here at church or standing somewhere in the grocery line. But when you sit down for a meal, something happens. Something happens and you, you feel this openness and sometimes you open up in ways you wouldn't if you were not enjoying a meal. Relationships build over meals and relationships are human. Spirituality is human. Those things that are linked by the realities of life. While we cannot exist without food, it's also true that our existence is deeply impaired if we lacked significant relationships or some type of spiritual awareness. That's why it's rare to have a social gathering without food because it's elemental and we sense it some way it feeds our bodies but moves our relationships to a deeper level. At this point in the scripture, the disciples and others gathered are immersed in chaos, fear, anxiety, guilt, grief, suspicion, restlessness. The king, their leader, he just died a bloody, horrific death. And now he's missing when all of a sudden, shalom, hey. Don't you remember when I was still with you? I said, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then, he opened their minds to understand. Well, really? Why didn't he just do that before? I mean, why all the drama? When he died, they wouldn't have experienced all this sadness. I mean, come on. When, they, when he was resurrected, they would have been okay with it. They'd been, hey, we knew you were coming back. I've given it some thought. I've looked at that text, I've given it some thought, and I believe the answer lies in the fact that the disciples had to experience the reality of Jesus' death and resurrection before they could truly understand the scriptures. Their hearts and minds couldn't be opened. They couldn't possibly understand until they were prepared for it by all of what they had heard, what they had seen, and what they had felt with Jesus. <clears throat> Have you ever met someone who considers themselves an expert on a certain place just by studying it? I mean, you're laughing because some of you have. So, oh, I, I studied this. And I have an example because it happens all the time. Journalist, now I'm going to butcher her name, I'm sorry. Artemis Cunho Triguero, who lives, was born and raised and has lived her entire life in the Amazon, complains about what she calls studies on the Amazon by people in other countries who have never traveled to the Amazon or have just explored a tiny little portion. She says, and I am going to quote her, so Please excuse any language that you deem should not be said. I am quoting. They cannot possibly know because it's so freaking gigantic. Over 5 million square kilometers, that's approximately 3.1 million miles, people often vastly underestimate the size of the forest, either because they're not really aware of its size or because they think deforestation has destroyed it. But it remains pretty damn big. The state I was born in, in Brazil, Amazonas, is both the largest state in the country and the one that contains the largest part of the rainforest. Most of it's still intact and wild, 
with over 1.5 million square kilometers. It's as big as the country of Mongolia and almost as big as Alaska, to give you some perspective. Not only that, but it's also very sparsely populated and underdeveloped. There are very few roads, so people have to either travel by boat or plane, which means traveling to isolated areas is difficult and sometimes even dangerous due to the lack of infrastructure. And you can't just fly over and map the area with cameras from above. Have you ever seen how thick the canopy is? Many people go to churches regularly. They know a lot about scripture, but they don't really understand it. They have been taught and listened, but not really experienced the word of God. They may even quote scripture, but still don't understand the true meaning of what was meant from those words. They are passive in letting the words flow over them instead of inside of them. It's as if they have ignited the pilot light but not turned the stove on. They haven't entered into the wholeness of the message contained in the text. They fail to link their life experiences to Scripture and allow those experiences and biblical prophecies to link and become part of their DNA. Perhaps some parts they have accepted and other parts they have rejected or just ignored without even considering the connections between all the parts. Indeed, a lot of us are like those commenting on the rainforest. We think we know, but we have never visited. Or perhaps we're like the disciples before Easter. We shrink away from what Jesus says. We don't want to hear about carrying the burdens of others. We don't want to hear about suffering for love. We don't want to hear about giving up family and home for the sake of the gospel, nor do we want to hear about how good people like Jesus have to die before they can become fully alive. Well, doesn't sound like good news to me. This material from Scripture is not good news to us. Just as it was not good news to the disciples, we cannot see how important it really is for us. Rather, for us, as for the disciples, good news, welcome news, consists of hearing about the glory to be given the faithful or hearing about the, how the righteous are going to be given power, the humble given the earth, and the poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven. That we like to hear about. But the reality is, we cannot have the kingdom of heaven without the willingness to put God before our own desires, our own families. We can't have power without the willingness to suffer. And we cannot have glory without the willingness to die. Until we understand that, until our minds are open to see the links between what we are now and what will be later, between what we experience now and what we will experience later, until we see the links between death and resurrection, the scriptures are a closed book. Nothing more. This is why Jesus did not open the minds of the disciples before the resurrection. Until he rose, the disciples didn't have the experience they needed in order to have their minds opened. Until he rose, the link between death and resurrection existed in their minds only as an unpleasant idea to be pushed aside. It certainly was not a glorious reality. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is the link between our experience and the message of Scripture. He is the link that can open our minds so that we might understand the Scriptures and indeed so we might understand our own lives. On the first Easter Sunday, 
Jesus did not give his disciples special, special knowledge so that they could understand the scriptures. What he did was open their minds by reminding them of what they had experienced with him and what they were then experiencing at that moment with him. And he pointed to the scriptures which spoke of the experience and he made those connections for them. He said, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. That is what is written that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. You're the witnesses of these things. Did you hear that part? You're, ha, ha. You're the witnesses of these things. I entitled the sermon, I'll show you mine, even if you don't show me yours. For two reasons. Well, three. One, it gets your attention. But, but the first was that Jesus was open about his scars because he wanted you to know the real connection. Feel it. See it. Hear it. He wanted it to be real to the disciples. The one who taught all those things. Now go share it. They never had to show theirs. Not at that point. And the second reason is you have to make a connection with the resurrection and your own life in order for it to be real. You have to show your scars. Jesus showed his, even if you don't show him. But you have to show them if you are going to make connection between the miracle of death and resurrection. If you have made the connection, witnessing is as easy as breathing. It's not a task. It's not something you do. It's just how you live, by showing your scars to everyone you meet. A final story. It's about a convert to the Christian faith who was asked by one of his atheist friends about Jesus. The friend said to him, hey, I, I hear you've become a Christian. Yes, said the convert. Then you must know a lot about this Jesus Christ. Yeah, a little. Well, tell me, what country was he born in? I don't know. Well, then, what was his age when he died? Uh, I don't know, replied the convert. Well, can you tell me how many sermons he preached or how he was born or how he did miracles or how he was raised from the dead? Asked the friend. Some friend, right? I don't know, responded the convert. You certainly know very little for a man who claims to be a Christian, said the friend. You're right, replied the convert. I am ashamed of how little I know, but I can tell you this. Three years ago, I was a hot mess. I was drunk all the time. I was in debt. My family was in shambles. My wife was ready to leave. And my kids hated me. I found God. And though it hasn't been easy, I am two years sober, out of debt, and I am rebuilding trust with my family. All this Christ has done for me. That's what I know. That's witnessing. Just showing your scars. I've been through this, and this is why I believe. You don't have to have the answers. You don't have to be all erudite in your speaking. You just have to show your scars. We can know the biography of Jesus. We can explore the laws that are written down. And we can debate the reasons till the cows come home for this or that or the other, or who should be in or who should be out. But none of us will give us the understanding 
that God wants each of us to have. If we would understand what the scriptures are really all about, then we must not only open them, we must allow Jesus Christ to open our minds by placing our trust in him, in the one to whom the scriptures point. We need to be vulnerable with one another about our faith, not our great knowledge of scripture. We need to show our scars wherever and with whomever God places in front of us in our ordinary, everyday lives. Amen. being an elder at Piney to Presbyterian Church. <laughs> it's always a great day in the life of the church and in when someone steps up to be an elder, a deacon, a worker back in tech, an organist, a choir member. It's almost in this church like everybody is already doing something. And that's really wonderful. At this time, um, Herb is here, and you're wondering, well, wasn't he already an elder? And yes, but he, he missed out on that great time when we installed every, and ordained everybody else. But I wanted to let you know that today we will be installing Herb, who, like Paul, has graciously agreed to extend their time of service for another year. So that is something big, and we didn't mention that, but Paul and her both have outdone their service, and we needed them, and they stepped up and said, yes, I will serve another year. So uh, we need to be grateful and thankful for that. In installation, the church sets in place with prayer. Those who have been ordained as deacons, elders, are now called anew to service in that ministry. As always... We should be excited, grateful, and thankful for those who continue to serve our Lord and our church in such faithful ways. So Christ gave himself, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Madam Moderator, on behalf of the session, I present to you Herb Dankmeyer for the Office of Elder. As I ask Herb these questions, I'd ask that you would all listen and remember when you were asked these questions or how you would answer them if you have not yet been asked. Do you trust in Jesus Christ your Savior? Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal, and God's word to you? If so, say, I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do and will be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, say, I do. I do. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture? And be continually guided by our confessions. If so, say, I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity? And will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, say, I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Love your neighbors and work for the reconciliation of the world. If so, say, I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, say, I do. Will you pray for and seek, this can be a hard one, to serve the people with energy, intelligence, that's the easy part, imagination, and love? If so, Say, I will. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Herb, will you continue to be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church and in your ministry? Will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will. All right, I'm going to ask you a question. Would you please rise, congregation? Do you, the members of Pineda Presbyterian Church, accept Herb as ruling elder, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will. Do you agree to pray for him? Don't say you're going to will if you're not praying for him. Do you agree to pray for him, to encourage him, to respect his decisions, and to follow as he continues to guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? If so, say, I will. You may be seated. So, Herb, I'm going to pray for you now. Let us all pray. Gracious God, we thank you for elders Herb, Pat, Sandy, Paul, Barb, Diane, and Karen, who continue to serve you to the best of their capabilities and energy. We would ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon them all, as well as those who serve throughout the church in other ways. You've called each of us through baptism as your own and marked as your own. Grant us the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Give everyone who serves a spirit of truthfulness that we might show the compassion of Christ in our daily, in all our daily deeds and doings. Give Herb the gifts of your Holy Spirit to build up this church, to strengthen the common life of your people, and to lead with compassion and vision. In the walk of faith and for the work of ministry, give to him your servant gladness and strength, discipline and hope, humility and courage, and of course, humor. Along with that, Lord, an abiding sense of your presence. Amen. I charge you, Pineda. Now, you, you really need to build up this church. 90% of you are elders. We need to be praying for one another. We need to be 
exuding the love of Christ to everyone we come in contact with so that they know they can come here and be part of the celebration of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Pray for your leaders. Encourage them so that they may never lack in zeal, keeping in spiritual fervor and serving the Lord in hope and patience. Let us welcome our friend, our continued friend, Herb. Dankmeyer, sorry if you don't know. Sorry to give you a hug. With gladness in our hearts, we offer our best to God in this act of commitment and sacrifice. We give because repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in the name of Jesus Christ to all nations, beginning where we are. Let us give according to our faith. Give with joy, gracious God, for you have been with us even when we were unfaithful. You have kept us in safety through times of grave distress. We can call on you in all times and places, in life and in death, knowing that your strength is available to sustain us. We give now that your church may be empowered in the proclamation of good news and the transformation of human life. Amen.
by the goodness of God, you were born. Remember that by the grace of Jesus Christ, you have been redeemed. Remember that he walks with you every day to comfort, to strengthen, to guide. He promised he would. Lo, I am with you always. Remember that you are called to be his witnesses to the amazing miracle of his death and resurrection. In the strength of those mighty promises, go forth now praising his name and living a life filled with the joy of resurrection until we are blessed to meet again. Amen.